Hey there, Slashaholics. Before we start tonight, I want to say a big thank you to all the patrons of this channel, because without them, the channel would simply not exist. So, a very big thank you to Jay Gardner, Michael Clark, The Jersey Devil, Jason Epstein, Alex Vanover, Carl of Cthulhu, Chris Dozier, Cinerenic CAX, EXC3LS10R84, Gucci Solo, Iron Alexa, Jackson Smith, Jordan Nicholson, Callie Gamer Girl 82, Catherine McClear, Katie Sabo, Kodo Bukia, Transformers Bishoho, Marshall Jenkins, Morgan Cherney, Nick Valcarve, Peyton Loeb, William Schaefer, Yusuf McRae, Alvaro M., Jacob Hill, Jeremy Wilson, Casey Hawaii, Liam Anderson, Scar, Donovan Shelton, EGSCW, Landon Turner, Mr. D. Authier, Nick, and Serpentrope. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate you. And if anybody listening would like to help support the channel to keep it going and growing for years to come, please consider joining our Patreon, making a PayPal or Cash App donation, or even ordering a Cameo video. All the information and links to do any of these is in the description and pinned comment below. We can't monetize the channel here on YouTube, so we really depend on Slashaholics like you to keep the channel going. Thank you all so much, and please enjoy tonight's narration of Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Interlude 3, from the Journal of Elias Voorhees, found among the papers of Pamela Voorhees, January 26, 1954. The boy and his mother were waiting for me in the front yard when I arrived home after spending all of yesterday afternoon and night with Martha Kimball. I could see it in Pamela's eyes that she knew what I had been up to. Maybe I should feel guilty. I did, after all, take vows before Almighty God and those in attendance at our little country wedding to honor and cherish her all the days of my life. But a man has needs, needs that have been met less and less frequently since Jason was born. Pamela only has eyes for him. Imagine that. I quite literally went to the very edge of hell itself to speak with abominable beings for her. I risked my eternal soul in the hopes that I could make her happy. And what was my reward? Not a loving and devoted wife, but an indifferent woman who was too busy following her strange child around to spare a moment for her husband. And let's not forget the boy. Jason is the oddest child I have ever encountered. An outsider observing him for a day would come away with the assumption that he is simple-minded, but that is far from the truth. He watches. He sees everything but keeps his own counsel. I know of only one time that he has ever spoken, and that was at school. The other kids were harassing him, which is the only kind of attention they give him. He has never had a friend in his life because the other kids are afraid of him. They are repelled by his strangeness. I was told by Jason's teacher that one kid pinned Jason to the ground and rubbed his face in the dirt. Jason did not cry, just stared at the child. It unnerved him and he sat back and asked Jason if he could speak at all or was he too dumb. Jason glared at him and whispered, Yes, I can. I was told the quality of his voice was such to chill the very marrow. The children fled from him in sheer terror. And then there is the injuries. Jason's teacher told me that the sand scratched his face quite badly, but he showed no wounds by the time he reached home. That was not the first time something like that has happened. He seems impervious to physical injury, with even the most grievous of hurts barely registering with him. Something came to me as I climbed from my truck and met the thing's glare. Like his classmates, I am afraid of him. I think I've always been. Well, Pamela let into me something fierce, cursing me for a mongrel dog in the most colorful language imaginable. I bore under the onslaught as stoic as an Asian monk. That was until she pushed me. I cannot bear another person putting their hands on me in anger. 
no matter if they be a man or a member of the fair sex. I responded in kind, slapping my wife across the face with my open hand. The sound echoed like a pistol shot across the yard and then silence fell. Pamela looked up at me in utter shock. I had never struck her before. I looked from her tear-stained cheeks to Jason and felt my gorge begin to rise. The other thing was more there than ever before. The malevolent creature that hid deep in Jason's soul, the devil that had brought him unholy life, stared at me as though it would kill me where I stood. That stare unmanned me. I turned from it in mortal fear and walked into the woods where I stayed until the sun was a memory to the night sky. I walked home and now sit writing this entry with my back in the corner, too afraid to turn my back on the door. It will be a long night. from Elias Voorhees' second journal, found among the papers of Martha Kimball, January 27, 1954. This horrible day began with me opening my old truck's door to find a dead rabbit draped across the driver's seat, its stomach torn wide and its entrails spread out. I knew it was Jason that done it. It was his little revenge for my striking his precious mother. I considered going back inside the house and tanning his hide with my belt, but I thought better of it. What good would it do to strap the boy when nothing seemed to harm him? I disposed of the carcass and then placed an old towel on the seat so that my pants would not be soiled by the blood. Then I cranked it up and set off on a day of work. It wasn't until I drew near the end of the driveway that I discovered there was more to Jason's vengeance than I first suspected. I depressed the brake pedal as there was another truck about to pass by, and the pedal sank to the floor. My truck did not slow and I plunged out into the oncoming truck's path. My life was spared by the quick reactions of the other driver who swerved enough to make it a glancing blow, which sent me into the ditch. I sat in stunned silence for minutes, willing my hammer and heart to slow. Finally, I regained control of my trembling form to step out of the cab and examine the damage. I got to my knees and crawled beneath the truck and froze in frozen horror at what I foresaw. The brake cable was cut cleanly into as if severed with a razor or a pair of shears. I am positive that the malfunction did not occur due to wearing over time. No, the cable was cut by purposeful hands with infernal intent. Jason cut the brake cable. My only son tried to murder me. But now that I have had time to ponder on it, I do not believe he is my son at all. I have come to believe that Jason's real father are the entities I entreated the dark deadites from the accursed book. Was Jason conceived by the demons in some abominable and blasphemous immaculate conception to mirror that of Christ's birth? I ran up the driveway in a rage and burst into the house. I found Jason and Pamela sitting down to breakfast in the kitchen. I opened my mouth to scream at the boy but stopped. The words turned to ashes in my throat. Jason stared at me with all the vengeful fires of the abyss burning in his eyes. It seemed to me that I could see worms crawling beneath his skin. He opened his mouth and I saw some black, squirming thing curling and uncurling there. I spun on my heels and fled from that house in abject terror. I had only the clothes on my back and a few coins in my wallet. 
I left behind a life and all my possessions, and I never looked back. I'm sitting now at Martha's dining room table while she sits across from me. She had taken me in without many questions. She says that she loves me. I do not know if I may love her like she deserves, but I will try. At least I will as long as it is safe to do so. I wonder how far is far enough to outrun the devil. I pray. Yes, I have begun to pray again in the hope that the God of the Bible will see fit to take me back after I have communed with the formless things that live in the outer dark. Maybe he will see fit to protect me. As for Jason, I wash my hands of the whole affair. Let his doting mother keep him and he her as long as it is far away from me. God, please keep him away from me. Martha wants me. I must go. Chapter 9 The Little Girl in the Pink Dress I'm going to say words to you, Campbell had said. Jason Voorhees. His response had elicited puzzled, uncomfortable stares from the douchebag reporter and the cameraman. Most people thought bounty hunters were insane, and he had just confirmed the fact for the two men. Why, that makes me think of a little girl in a pink dress, sticking a hot dog through a donut. But they were wrong. Sure, Duke was eccentric and a little abrasive, but he was far from crazy. Her name was Annie Brackett. Duke first met her at Smith's Grove Park in Haven, New Jersey, when they were eight years old. She was at a family reunion. He was out for a play date with his neighbor. Duke didn't remember the boy's name now. He wasn't important, had in fact moved the following year. Annie was important. He was sitting at the bottom of a slide eating a soggy peanut butter and jelly sandwich when he caught sight of her. She was sitting on the edge of the merry-go-round with her pretty white dress, shoes digging into the soft sand, leaving a thin circular furrow. She held a glazed donut in her left hand and was busily poking a half-eaten hot dog in and out of the pastry center hole. What are you doing? he asked as he walked over and sat down beside her. Why are you playing with your food like that? My older sister told me this was dirty, she said. But I don't know why. Do you know why? Duke, raised in church by his devout mother and essentially innocent at that tender age, shook his head. I don't know, but it looks funny. Annie looked up into his face and giggled. That was all it took. Duke was smitten. As it turned out, they lived one block away from each other, though they attended different schools. They became inseparable. It helped that both of their parents became fast friends, which meant they barely went a day without seeing each other. Years passed and things changed as they are wont to do, deepening Duke and Annie's relationship until it was something much more than friendship. Junior year of high school came, and they attended prom together. They sat beneath the dim gymnasium lights and talked about their future together, never doubting everything would work out. Then Duke decided to take her for a midnight boat ride at Crystal Lake. She seemed so excited. Her smile was so bright it seemed to light up the night around them. He drove them from Haven along Cunningham Road, passing by the park where they met. They passed through the darkened neighboring town like phantoms and turned down a dirt road. Duke pulled to a stop by an old dock and the two of them stared at the full moon over the placid lake. Its light silver road reflected on the water's surface. I love you, she said, kissing him on the cheek. I love you more, 
he answered back. I love you first, she giggled. It was a perfect moment, the last one of his life. They got out of the car and he led her by the hand down the shore to a wooden rowboat tied to the end of the dock. He helped her in, untied the rope, and paddled them out toward the center of the lake. There was a small battery-powered storm lantern beneath his seat. He pulled it out and turned it on, illuminating the area with bluish LED light that made her eyes shine. He took her hand. You are beautiful. She opened her mouth to say something, but the words died on her lips as something struck the bottom of the boat hard enough to rock it. What was that? she asked, her voice trembling with unease. Are there any alligators in this lake? Duke started to laugh, and the boat was hit again, much harder this time. The fun was over. Duke grabbed the paddle, held it over the water. The figure that exploded from the dark lake was forever imprinted on Duke's mind. A still frame nightmare. It wore muddy, torn clothes and a yellowed, old-fashioned hockey mask on its face. Duke knew its name, had heard it passed around school like a campfire ghost story. Jason Voorhees, the demon of Camp Blood, was real and he had come for them. Jason struck Annie, wrapped his arms around her, and carried her over the edge of the boat into the midnight black water. The boat capsized, tossing Duke after them into the freezing water. The world turned upside down and for a moment he was unable to tell which direction the surface was. Finally, his head broke into the night air, and he was looking around for any sign of Annie. There was nothing, not even bubbles rising to disturb the water. He screamed her name until his voice was gone. He dove down over and over, willing his eyes to pierce the shadows to where she was. He never saw her again. In the end, he swam to the shore and drove to the nearest gas station and called the county sheriff. What followed was an endless night where he was interrogated until the sun came up. No one wanted to believe that their old boogeyman was still around and up to his old tricks. But Duke knew better. A fire was lit in his hardened heart. Romance was dead. Love was gone forever. Because she was dead. There would never be another Annie. A plan formed in his mind. One that would drive him until he sweated blood. He studied martial arts, learned to use many weapons and guns. He learned investigative techniques. He dieted and exercised until he was in better shape than most professional athletes. He became Creighton Duke, Bounty Hunter. All so that he could one day kill the monster that took his soulmate from him. Some said he was obsessed. They called him Ahab and Jason his great white well. Maybe it was true. But he didn't care. All that mattered to him now was the plan. Duke sighed and sat up on the paper-thin vinyl covered mattress and rubbed his eyes. Things had gone sideways, but only slightly so. Big Bad Sheriff Landis thought he had him cowed. It was only a matter of time and patience until Duke taught him otherwise. A little old man with delusions of grandeur would not derail his mission. Not when he was so close to seeing the task done. Not when he had finally figured out what he had to do to end Jason once and for all. Not when he had the Kandarian dagger, the tool Jessica Kimball would need to send Voorhees straight to hell. He crossed his arms over his broad chest and smiled. Soon. Chapter 10, Stephen's Big Break It was funny how a glimpse could turn your whole world upside down. Two seconds spent staring at Jessica holding their baby, and he was ready to walk through all nine layers of Dante's Inferno for the both of them. Stephen didn't even know the baby's name. He glanced around his tiny cell in frustration. Randy told him not to do anything stupid, and he had responded with the claim that there was nothing he could do because he was locked up. That, strictly speaking, wasn't entirely true. He had always been good at sleight of hand, could slip a pair of handcuffs with relative ease. He'd even done a few magic shows as a small child before he lost interest in performing. Still, 
he kept practicing in the solitude of his room, away from prying eyes that might judge him for his nerdy hobby. A half-baked plan was forming in his mind, and Randy was the key. He trusted Stephen would never dream that Stephen would do anything to harm him. Stephen wouldn't, not really, but the assumption would put Randy off guard. Stephen would give it a little more time to see if Randy could sway the sheriff. If he couldn't... The low rumble of laughter drew Stephen from his thoughts, and he turned to see Creighton Duke watching him through the bars that separated their respective cells. You're just about the saddest sack of shit I ever seen, Duke said. A Cheshire cat grin spread across his face. Why don't you just shut up, Stephen said. He turned away in irritation. Weren't they both in enough trouble without trying to make each other more miserable? Duke continued as if he hadn't heard Stephen's remark. Accused of murder, and not just any murder, but the murder of the mother of the girl you love. You know what, kid? That's fucked up. I didn't do it. Oh, I know you didn't, chuckled Duke. He stood and crossed to the bars, eyeing Stephen from between them with mean-spirited mirth. The problem is, how are you going to get anyone else to believe you? It's a hell of a predicament, make no mistake. Stephen opened his mouth, but no sound came out. He was lost for words. It doesn't matter who you think you saw in that house. It was Jason Voorhees that killed Diana, Duke said. Stephen gasped, remembering Diana's last words and the demon beyond the mirror. <laughs> How'd you know that? Duke held up one finger, ignoring Stephen's question. There's only one way to put an end to that devil. And they don't know that way. Stephen approached the bars, coming face to face with the bounty hunter. And you do? Duke nodded, a stilly glint in his eyes. Tell me what to do. Duke clicked his tongue, shook his head in mock sadness. Information like that is very expensive. And I don't think you have what it takes to pay. I don't think you have the stones to take on this fight either, kid, Duke thought. You think you are tough enough, but I know you aren't. You're getting in over your head, he continued thinking. Try me, Stephen said. Okay, kid, Duke thought. You asked for it. Now your good buddy Duke is going to teach you a lesson about your place in the world. You aren't the hero. You're just background noise, Duke thought. Duke reached between the bars, holding his hands out. Give me your hands. Stephen frowned, hesitant to let the intense man touch him. What? Why? Your hand, Duke repeated. Give it to me. Stephen extended his left hand, and Duke took it gingerly, caressing Stephen's fingers almost as a lover would. The bounty hunter's palms were calloused and rough, like sandpaper to Stephen's smooth skin. Duke stared into Stephen's eyes, taking his measure and finding him wanting. See, Duke said, everything and everyone has a price, and the cost of this is very, very high. Are you ready to pay? What's the price? Duke rubbed Stephen's left pinky between his own fingers. Are you ready to pay? With a sense of foreboding, Stephen nodded. Crack! Pain exploded up Stephen's arm as Duke snapped his pinky sideways. Stephen hit the floor, scooted away to put space between himself and the psycho who laughed on the other side of the bars. The only way to kill Jason Voorhees is to destroy his heart, and there's only one person who can do that now that Diana is dead, Duke said. Her daughter. What the hell? Mm, Jessica? Duke nodded. He will try to get her before she can get to him. A cold hand gripped Stephen's heart at the bounty hunter's words, and he had to take a deep breath to steady himself. What does he want with her? The same thing he wanted her mother for. 
Stephen grunted in frustration, approaching the bars. Come on, man! Quit being evasive! Just tell me! Duke smiled regretfully down at Stephen, though the smile didn't reach his eyes. You want information? You gotta pay. Stephen glanced down at his rapidly swelling pinky and then back up. Fuck, man! Come on! Duke reached out. Your hand. Fear brought stinging tears to Stephen's eyes and he blinked them away before they could fall. It would not do to show any weakness to the man. He held out his shaking left hand and felt Duke grab his ring finger. Are you ready to pay? Duke asked. Stephen closed his eyes and nodded. Snap! Stephen hit the floor again, screaming in articulate agony at this fresh assault. His hand felt like a white-hot anvil throbbing at the end of his arm. Duke knelt down to Stephen's level and continued. Those FBI idiots destroyed Jason's body, so now he needs a new one. The ones he's jumping in and out of right now can't last. They get diseased. He grows weak. They aren't enough. He needs to be truly reborn again, and he needs Jessica to do it. Why, Jessica, Stephen growled through clenched teeth. Duke stood up, slapping his thighs. Now see, that is a very, very expensive question, boy. And I don't think you have what it takes to pay the price. Stephen stood up and shoved his left hand into Duke's, surprising the older man. There was no more hesitation in Stephen's face. Tell me, he said. Duke studied Stephen, speechless for a moment. Perhaps he had misjudged the boy. Perhaps, perhaps he was made of sterner stuff than first met the eye. Duke patted the back of Stephen's wrist and then released it. He leaned against the bars with the first real smile he'd worn since the encounter had begun on his face. Good on you, kid, he thought. This one is on the house. In a Voorhees was he born, through a Voorhees may he be reborn, and only by the hands of a Voorhees will he die. You see, Jason's pappy got up to some serious dark shit, and it put a stain on the family. It is such a powerful shadow that it was passed down from father to his offspring. Jason had a sister, your girlfriend's mother, Diana. Now that she is dead, Jason has only two blood relatives left in the world, with the power to kill him or make him reborn. Jessica and the baby, Stephen whispered. I've got to get out of here. I've got to protect them. Duke shook his head. The only way to do that is to kill Jason Voorhees, and you can't do that. Jessica must do it. Tell her of her birthright. You have to find a way to make her believe you... How am I supposed to do that? I barely believe it and I saw him in the mirror when he killed Diana. She already knows where she comes from, Duke said. You need to find something to prove that you are telling the truth. Go to the old Voorhees house off Cunningham Road and find proof. Because if you don't, Jason will kill her and your baby. Stephen looked away from the man. His mind a whirl with impossibilities and nightmares come true. It seemed him, an invisible guillotine, cut its deadly arch over all their heads, counting the seconds until the death of everyone he loved with tiny clicks and clacks. His hand throbbed with each beat of his heart, giving him an idea. He glanced up at the cell door and frowned. He thought the plan might work, but he felt bad about the details. Oh well, Randy would forgive him in the end. Hold on to your butt, he thought as he stepped closer to the door. Here goes nothing. He cleared his throat and began to scream, letting some of his fear and pain show in his voice. Running footsteps echoed off the cinder block walls and tile floor, and then Randy was there, his face pale, his eyes wide. What is it? Randy shouted. What's going on? Stephen held his left hand out to show Randy the twisted fingers. That son of a bitch in the next cell broke my fingers. Duke shrugged. Four-eyed little shit had it coming. 
Randy ignored this aside, motioned for Stephen to come closer. Let me take a look. Stephen let Randy take his hand, waited for him to lower his head, and then reached through the bars with his good right hand. He grabbed Randy's lapel with all his strength and pulled him around until the deputy's back was to him. He used his left to draw Randy's Beretta 9mm from its holster. Holding on to it with thumb and two good fingers, Randy felt the cold steel barrel against his temple and froze in disbelief. Shit, Stephen! What the hell do you think you're doing? Stephen squeezed Randy tighter and hissed for him to be quiet. Randy let his hands fall limp to his sides. You stupid asshole, Randy muttered. I told you not to do anything dumb and what do you do? Attempt some half-assed jailbreak? You just wait until I get my hands on you. I'm going to beat you, dumbass, like your daddy should have. He did beat me, Stephen said. The lesson didn't sink in. Now carefully take the keys off your belt and open the cell. Randy didn't move. You wouldn't shoot me. Stephen groaned internally. He didn't have time for half measures. Every second that passed brought a monster closer to ending his whole world. He thumbed the pistol's hammer back until it clicked in Randy's ear. You might be right. Now open the cell. Randy shivered under Stephen's grip, finally filled with enough doubt to give him pause. He took the key ring from his belt and slowly turned to face his friend. The pistol's bore between them was like the mouth of some great beast that desired to swallow worlds. Randy inserted the key, twisted it, and slid the cell door open. Stephen motioned him inside with the gun, hardly able to meet his friend's gaze for the judgment he saw there. Randy obeyed and Stephen stepped out, yanking the keys from Randy's belt as he passed. Stephen slid the door shut and then stuffed the pistol into the waistband of his jeans. Listen to me, Stephen, Randy said, hands raised before him. Please don't do this, man. They will shoot you on sight if you escape. That's a chance I'm going to have to take, Stephen said as he pocketed the keys and jogged up the corridor. The sound of his footsteps like pursuing purposeful death snapping at his heels. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Interlude 3 from the Journal of Elias Voorhees, as well as chapters 9 and 10 of Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Every time I read a new chapter of this, I'm more and more impressed, Jeremy. You're doing a great job. So glad that we're getting through this book even more. Uh, this movie is underrated, in my opinion, and I think a lot of people give it a hard time because they've heard so many people give it a hard time. But if you were to go back, like right now, and watch this movie again now, uh, older than you were maybe back when you formed your first opinion of it, and you, you'll see that, you know, underneath, it is a Friday the 13th story. It has a lot of the rules of the other movies, but it adds something new to it. It gives us some lore into Jason that actually makes some sense in parts, you know? I wish they would have let them, uh, you know, dive deeper into the Necronomicon and Dead-Eyed of it all. Uh, but, you know, Jeremy's taking care of that right now. Um, from, the, from the beginning where he connected uh, Jason Takes Manhattan <clears throat> to, this, uh, to Jason Goes to Hell, uh, to where we are now, getting a backstory on the little girl in the pink dress, you know, with uh, sticking a, a hot dog through a donut. Loving it. Uh, we got that backstory. We found out about what happened to her, that they were boyfriend and girlfriend. Jason got her. You know, we didn't get to see Jason kill her or find out that she was definitely dead. She did disappear under the water, so I'm guessing chances are she is dead. Uh, but we get to find out what drives Creighton Duke, and I think that's exciting. And I love that those little added things like that. Uh, I, I believe the original script called for some from things like that that didn't actually make it into the movie. And, you know, getting to go into Creighton Duke's head and Steven's head as he's in the cell... And we go through that whole scene where Creighton's breaking his fingers and everything. I thought that really added. Uh, it made more sense of why he was breaking Stephen's fingers. You know, like showing, putting, him, putting the kid in this place. Uh, you know, seeing how much uh, grit this kid actually had. And Stephen stepped up and proved himself. Especially when he handed his hand for the third question. Um, 
but yeah, great, great chapters. Uh, love the stuff with Elias, you know, leaving Pamela because Jason just freaked him out. Uh, you know, after he hit Pamela, the rabbit, the brakes, all of it. Loved it. I hope this doesn't mean that there's no more di or journal entries from Elias. Uh, but if there isn't, it was still fun uh, that you included that in the book. And I appreciate it. Having a lot of fun with this one. So everybody, if you're listening, please take the time to click the like button. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. And please drop a comment. Let Jeremy know what you think of his book so far. Uh, and I love to talk to you all too. Let me know what you think of tonight's chapters and the book in general up to this point. And I'll be back very soon with more of Jason Goes to Hell by Jeremy Terry very soon. Uh, also, if you haven't done so already, check out my... Uh, I have a full original Friday the 13th novella here on the channel that I wrote and narrated called Friday the 13th Quarantine. It takes place at the end of the world during a zombie apocalypse. And I'm currently releasing chapters of a full-length novel called Celestial Slumber, uh, a Nightmare on Elm Street story. It's basically Freddy X, uh, Freddy in Space. And I know that might sound like, oh my god, that, that's going to be horrible, but the story is actually a lot of fun. The characters are fun. Uh, Freddy is very dark in this book that I'm writing. And uh, I think if you give it a shot, you'll enjoy it. All right, everybody. Until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying, thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. See you soon.